All of this is happening in one book. And it's not only happening with God's perfect number, but it's happening with the most important persons by far of that book, and that is God, and that is Jesus Christ. Hey, how's it going? So I want to go over a macro pattern, as I call it. That's a made-up word that I made up. And I made that word up because it kind of describes this really big pattern that spans across the Bible. And it's so significant and so serious that I think it should knock the socks off of just about anybody who sees it. No matter what background you come from, whether you are a, a Muslim or a Jew uh, or a Christian who doesn't believe in a perfect Bible, I believe this is going to start opening your eyes to, well, maybe there is a perfect book out there that God himself has sealed and stamped his own approval on. And when it comes to miracles in the Bible, we know that they are basically verifying God has indeed sent this person, and God has indeed spoken this word, and God is showing his approval. So I believe that's kind of what we're seeing here with this macro pattern. And when you look at this, I want you to realize a few things before we even start. And that's the fact that this is just one thing. We're just dealing with one pattern in this video. And over the next couple videos in this series, we're going to be building and building and building and building. And I don't know when it's going to get to the point where you'll be convinced. A lot of people watching this are already convinced that the King James Bible is perfect. But there are also people watching this who are going to laugh and mock and scorn and try to demonize it. Well, I'm just going to say up front, you can demonize it if you want, but that doesn't refute it. That doesn't get rid of the evidence. The Pharisees demonized Jesus when he performed the miracle of casting out the devil. And they said that his power comes from Beelzebub. They demonized him. That's what a lot of people do to this type of thing as well. When they see evidence for a perfect Bible, they start demonizing it. So be careful of what you do, because if this is truly of God, then you're basically mocking God at that point. And I really hope you don't do that. So let's start off by, by reading a scripture. So if we go to 1 John 4, 14, it says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So obviously, if you do not believe in the Son, then you do not have the Savior, according to the Bible, according to the New Testament. So here we go. Let's dive in. I'm going to try to explain this as simply as I can. It's pretty easy to understand, but I'm going to walk through it at a, a, at a basic, normal pace, and I'm not going to try and rush anything. So this is Father and Son in the King James Bible. I don't have enough time to dive into why the King James Bible, but if you're watching this, just understand that it's the most printed and most influential Bible ever printed. More influential, uh, it has produced more fruit than any other Bible that has ever existed in any language, even in the original Hebrew and Greek languages. So this is a major Bible. This is not just a random Bible we're talking about. Okay, so Father and Son. So we're looking at all mentions of Father and Son when it's referring to God and Jesus. The capitalized mentions of God and Jesus in the King James Bible. If it's not capitalized, obviously it doesn't count. We're looking at the capitalized mentions of God the Father and Jesus the Son, the Son of God. So in the Old Testament, there's actually five mentions of the Father and Son. So those are in... Psalm 2, 7, Psalm 2, 12, Isaiah 9, 6, Daniel 3, 25, and Daniel 7, 13. If you are looking in a search program, I should probably emphasize this. 
if we were to type in sun all and make this case sensitive, which means it's looking at capitalized mentions, and if we just turn on the Old Testament, we're going to see 65 mentions of sun. That's because in the book of Ezekiel, God talks, he refers to Ezekiel as son of man. And he said unto me, son of man, stand upon thy feet. This is not talking about Jesus Christ. So what I do with this is I label this as an anti-mention. And with all anti-mentions, I exclude them. I do not include them in the counts. And this gives us the pure count for how many times we're looking at son capitalized when it's actually referring to Jesus Christ. So there is a lot of mentions of son of man in Ezekiel. And what we're going to do to make it easier is just go to the filters and just remove that entire book from the filters. And we're left with all the mentions of son in the Old Testament that are just referring to Jesus Christ. So Psalm 2, 7, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Psalm 2, 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way. Daniel 3, 25, the fourth is like the son of God. Daniel 7, 13, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. So here are all the mentions of Son in the Old Testament. And then if we look at the one mention of Father in Isaiah, he shows up right here. Isaiah 9, 6, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All right. Now, let us go to, interesting, by the way, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Notice how son, that's talking about Jesus, but it's not capitalized. That's pretty wild. And that happens elsewhere in the Old Testament as well. But we're not going to include that because that's not capitalized. It's We're just looking at capitalized mentions. And for whatever reason, this is how it appears in all King James Bibles that are printed today. So we're going with it. And what we find is utterly miraculous. So that's the Old Testament. So we have a total of one mention of Father and four mentions of Son when referring to God or Jesus. Now, all of them are referring to Jesus, actually, because it's talking about the Son in, in Isaiah 9-6. So let's move on to the Gospels. So the Gospels, of course, are detailing the ministry, the life, the death, the burial, burial the resurrection of Jesus Christ mostly about his ministry and what he did here while he was ministering on earth for three years. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels. In the book of Matthew, you will get a total mention, total count of 43 mentions of Father, 54 mentions of Son, or a total of 97 mentions. Now again, if you're just searching for that on your computer software, so if we go back here and we just look at the book of Matthew, and I'm going through this, I'm, in the beginning at least, I want to go through this step by step so you, can, so you can follow along. Now notice how the total is 99 mentions, and we have 97 here. That's because, again, there are anti-mentions. There's two of them. So in Matthew 9, 2, it says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Obviously, Jesus talking to this man who has the palsy, calling him son, that's not Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of a, of a quote of Jesus talking. And when that happens in the King James Bible, you have a capitalized word. So, and then we also have in Matthew 21, 28, he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. That's in Matthew 21, 28. That's Jesus talking about a parable, and the parable is not talking about Jesus Christ, the Son. There are parables that are referring to the Son and referring or referring to the Father. And if that were the case, we would obviously include it because it's directly talking about God the Father or Jesus the Son. But in this case, in fact, let's just go there. Matthew 21, 28. And... Let's see here. It says, let's start in verse 27. They answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? 
A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. So this parable is talking about the publicans and harlots, not talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's two end dimensions in Matthew, which means that total count of 99 drops down to 97. And let's go to Mark. So that was Matthew. Mark has one anti-mention. There are a total of five mentions of father, 26 mentions of son, total of 31 mentions, and it's another anti-mention of son. He said unto the sick of, pal of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So again, that's parallel to what happened in Matthew 9.2. So again, there in Mark 2.5, we'll exclude that from the count. Now let's go to the Gospel of Luke. In Luke, we have a total of 58 mentions, but Luke is where it gets interesting because we're dealing with not only anti-mentions, but we're dealing with parable mentions. And I was just talking about this previously, but let's just go over this again, because without this, this none of these patterns would work. None of these major patterns you're about to see would fall into place. And first of all, the anti-mentions are in Luke 15, and Luke 16. So in Luke 15, it's the prodigal son. It says, and he said unto him, son, thou art ever with me. And um, let's just go there real quick. Luke 15, 31. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatty calf. Now this is the older brother, the older son, uh, basically, you know, questioning his father about why he's throwing this party for the pro the prodigal son who came back. Why not anything for himself? And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Obviously, not talking about Jesus Christ. So, let's go back here. Now, Luke 16 is where the other two anti-mentions occur. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now this is talking about the rich man in hell in Luke chapter 16. And this is the rich man in hell talking to Abraham across the gulf. And he says, Father Abraham. That's not talking about God the Father. And then the very next verse, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. Now remember, the reason these are capitalized is because they're the beginning of a quote. It's the very first word of the quote and and in the King James Bible, there's no quotation marks. But if there were quotation marks, just like in English you know, grammar today, you capitalize the first word. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know. Is that a rule in English grammar today? I'm not even sure. Do you always capitalize the first word of a, of a quote? Um, I, I'm an expert on the King James Bible grammar, not on English grammar, <laughs> if, that's, if it's different. Um, Okay, so the parables are not about Jesus, and they're not about God the Father. Now let's go to the parable mentions. Now here's where, like I said, it gets kind of interesting. Because it says in Mark 4, 11, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, Thus, at any time, they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven, forgiven them. So, these mentions will get... Basically, here's what can happen. The Christian will look at this and say, Well, yes, that's talking about God the Father. But someone who's trying to pick everything apart and destroy these and do whatever they can to get rid of this pattern in the Bible that so obviously proves God inspired the Bible, what they will do is say, well, that's not directly talking about God the Father. That's just a parable that Jesus is saying. And it's not even consistent capitalizing Father. For example, right here, he said to his father, Father, well, 
what are we talking about here? This is again the prodigal son. So in Luke 15, 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion. Now he's asking for his inheritance. This is right before he goes off, takes the inheritance and blows it. Verse 18 says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Luke 15, 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Now, this is literally directly talking about God the Father. And how do we know that? In the actual Bible, in the text itself, in the previous verses, the parable is about God the Father, and we can see that in Luke 15, 7, and 10, which are directly preceding these verses. So let's go back up here to 7 and 10. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God, over one sinner, sinner that repenteth. So then he gets into the parable of the prodigal son. The parable is about the prodigal son coming back to God, coming back to the Father. So this is these parable mentions are about God, the Father. Therefore, even though there's some are lowercase, some are capitalized, we're going with the capitalized mentions. It's it, it counts. It's God the Father. Even though it's a parable, it's literally talking about God the Father and nobody else. So what do you do? You have to include it. All right, so there's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now on to the last gospel, which is John. And John does not have any anti-mentions. And actually, nowhere else in the rest of the Bible are there any anti-mentions of Father or Son. From this point out, as in, at least in the singular form which is what we're looking at. We're only looking at singular mention or singular father and singular son. We're not looking at fathers with a possessive. I'm not looking at sons with a possessive. Okay. Book of John, there's 114 mentions of father, 43 mentions of son, 157 total. So where does that leave us in total? So we have, all we have to do now is just add up 97 plus 31 plus 58, plus 157. And what is the total? The total is 343, which equals 7 times 7 times 7 mentions in the Gospels of Father and Son when referring to God and Jesus. It, we're, that's not including any of the anti- If you were to... Just type, just look this up quickly in your Bible search software. You would never find this. You have to diligently go through each mention, each verse, and exclude the ones that are not talking about God the Father or God the Son. Otherwise, you're not going to, you're not going to realize this is actually in the Bible. <clears throat> now, seven is God's perfect number. And I think this in itself should be at least, it's either an anomaly, it's either random chance, or it's there by divine purpose. God has inspired it and put it there. Which one is it? Now, if you're being unbiased, taking an unbiased look at this, you have no choice but to at least say, there might be something to it, we need to investigate further. You have to at least make that, you have to come to that conclusion. If you don't come to that conclusion, you are being dishonest because you are presented with a pattern in the Gospels, which is what is detailing the Father sending a Son into the world and is detailing everything about the Son. You have to admit at least there could be something to that. And if you don't, you are automatically being biased, and you're automatically, your, your worldview is in your way. You, you can't get out of your worldview. So, 
What do we do? Well, well, whether you come with us, you can turn this video off now if you want. But what we're going to do is we're going to keep investigating and keep looking. Because right now, it's almost as if we see kind of like a tip of an iceberg peeking out. But we don't know how much is underneath the water. We just see this little bit coming out, and it looks pretty significant based off of this so far. So let's unpack the scuba gear, and let's go exploring, and let's see how big this iceberg truly is. Or if, is it just a little floating piece of ice that we thought was really big, but there's really not much else to it? Okay, so let us keep moving. So in the book of Acts, Father is mentioned three times. And Son is mentioned six times, so a total of nine. Now, the book of Acts will have significance a little bit later on as we go through this. But for now, let's follow along. In the first seven epistles, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, from Romans to Colossians, we're looking at all the mentions of Father and Son, and we have 11 in Romans, 5 in 1 Corinthians, etc. Once again, we just add them all up. And what are the total? The total is 49 mentions. In the first seven epistles, there are seven times seven mentions of Father and Son. Okay, now let's go to the last 14 epistles. So that would look like, well, first of all, also let me point out, the very last, the seventh epistle, not the very last, but the seventh epistle has seven mentions of Father and Son. Now let's move on to the last 14 epistles. The last 14 epistles produce a total of 77 mentions of Father and Son. And in the book of Revelation, the very last book, which is not an epistle, it's a book about prophecy, about the end times. You get four mentions of Father, three mentions of Son, for a total of seven mentions in the Apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That leaves us with something special, something even more interesting than we thought it was from the very surface, from that iceberg that we saw. Now that we're underneath and, and searching, we're, we're seeing something bigger take shape here. We're, we're seeing something bigger in front of our eyes. That is a lot to take in and to consider as just you know a, a random chance. But it gets way deeper than this. We need to keep exploring, trust me. Okay, let me hide this title because it's in the way now. Now we're looking at the first 12 books of the New Testament. And what do we see? Now 12 is also a perfect number of God in the Bible. It has a slightly different purpose than 7. 7 is like rest, and it's about oaths and swearing. Whereas 12 is more about uh, authority and governing. There was 12 tribes of Israel. 12 apostles of the Lamb. The New Jerusalem is 12 in every single dimension, shape, and form that you can imagine. You can look at that Revelation 21, um, 12, where all the 12 start. So, in the first 12 New Testament books, now we're looking at verses. So, obviously, Father and Son, you could have two mentions, or even more, you could have three or four mentions of Father and Son, all together in one verse. So that's why if you look at the first 12 books, we're also getting that pattern of 343 or 7 times 7 times 7. It's because you can fit a lot more mentions into one verse, and that would only count as one verse. So if you look in the first 12 books of the New Testament, there are 7 times 7 times 7 verses that mention Father and Son. And if you look at the first seven books post-Gospels, so starting with Acts and any of Philippians, you get 
seven times seven or 49 verses that mention father and son. So that's where Acts comes into play. It comes into play with both of these patterns because those those nine mentions, and we'll, we'll, let's see how many verses it would be. In Acts, well, nine verses. So nine mentions in nine verses in the book of Acts. That plays into these patterns. Without those nine verses, you wouldn't have uh, these patterns. So these patterns are starting to intersect each other in interesting ways. And I believe that's an even greater sign that we have a divine inspiration over the text. Not only do we have his perfect number just showing up everywhere, we have overlap of mentions, of verses, of perfect divisions of the Gospels and the first 12 books, first seven epistles, first seven books post call. It's like no matter where you look, this thing is perfect. And it's overlapping with each other. If you look at all of Paul's epistles, from Romans to Hebrews, you get a perfect 70 verses. 70, again, in the Bible is heavily significant. God uses that number often in the Bible because it has to do with seven, his perfect number. God works in patterns, and God conceals things. And one of the things that pops up a lot, at least for me, is, well, why would God hide that or conceal that? Dude, why would God hide or conceal Jesus? For all of history until he was revealed. What God, God hides things all the time. Even prophecy. We don't know exactly how prophecy is going to unfold. We have a, a an idea based on what the prophecy says. But only God knows the future. And he conceals things until it is time to reveal them. Um, just a quick verse. Proverbs 25.2 It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. God gets glory out of concealing things. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And that's what we're doing. We're literally searching. Search the scriptures, Jesus said. They are they which testify of me. And that's clearly what's happening here so far. So Paul is where we get our doctrine in the New Testament today, the doctrine of the gospel of grace. Paul expounds on what happened at the cross in the gospels with Jesus what his atonement did for us. Without Paul, we would be in a lot of confusion today. So Paul is very significant. And the fact that there's 70 verses validating Paul's <laughs> epistles is just mind-blowing. Okay? Now this pattern stretches from the beginning to the end of the New Testament. Basically, what we're looking at is the first five books first so the historical books so the historical books as you can see i have this historical marker from matthew to acts this is just detailing all the history of the new testament well the epistles are letters being written from paul to churches or paul to the people but the historical books include the gospel and acts is because it's literal history being detailed it's actual events and actual people in different places so in the historical books and by the way, if, if I didn't break this down, I don't think I broke this down exactly, but with this blue pattern here with the first 12 books, you have the historical books, which is five books, and then you have the first seven epistles. That's all it is. So historical plus first seven epistles. Now we're looking at the historical books plus the last seven epistles to mention father or son. Not all the last epistle so third john does not mention them so the, that one would not be included in this pink pattern the pink pattern is looking at hebrews james first peter second peter first john second john and jude because that's where you find mentions so one two three four five six seven so there are a total of seven times seven times seven verses in the last seven epistles and in the historical books, which means the first seven and the last seven combined with the historical books both produce seven times seven times seven verses. 
that's a lot to take in. And of course, Revelation is uh, mentioned in seven verses. Let's verify that since I don't have that here. Let's just look at Revelation. Yes, seven appearances and seven verses. The last verse is in Revelation 14, 14. 14 is literally seven times two. Also, 14 in the Bible is the, the number of Passover. That's the day the Passover was kept. Okay. All of this is happening in one book. And that book is the King James Bible. And it's not only happening with God's perfect number, and it's not only happening in one book, but it's happening with the most important persons by far of that book, and that is God. It's not even, not even a human. And that is Jesus Christ, the God-man, the Savior. We're dealing with the absolute, uttermost, most important people, persons, entities, God. We're dealing with the most important, in the most important, the most significant. And I can't emphasize that enough because one of the big objections to all of this is that you can produce patterns like these in any text. I challenge you to show me the most important people of that text with those with the most important people's new numbers that they have deemed to be the perfect number in such scale and quantity and weight as what you see here and this is not even it. Now what we need to do is look at the grand total well, actually, first I forgot one. Hold on. Sorry. Um, and John's writings at the end of the Bible. First John, second John, third John doesn't have any mentions, and then Revelation. So in all those uh, three, four books, total of seven times seven mentions. I'm not sure if that's mentions or we, we can easily find out. Should it be verses or mentions? Let's see. Maybe it's both. So 1st John and 2nd John, 45, yeah, 45 mentions in 35 verses, which is 7 times 5. Okay. Alrighty then. That is quite the coincidence going on. That's quite the, <laughs> that's quite the happy accident you have. But here's where, where it gets utterly mind-blowing to a different level where who can ascribe this to random chance? I want to know. Father in total, in the King James Bible, shows up 259 times. 259 equals 7 times 37. And it also equals a third of 777. 777 divided by 3 equals 259. That's how many times that Father shows up in the King James Bible, referring to God. Now, what about Jesus, the Son? 231 mentions, which equals 77 times 3, or 7 times 33. So you have both the Father and God and Son perfectly divisible by 7 in, I mean, in ways that are, I mean, it matches perfectly. You have 777 divided by 3 for Father, 77 times 3 for Son. 7 times 37 for father, 7 times 33 for son. I mean, I don't know how much perfect you could you could make it. 3 is also God's perfect number, by the way. There, These three are one. The Godhead is made of three people, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So in total, here's how many mentions we have in the entire Bible. We have 490 mentions, which equals... 70 times 7. 70 times 7 mentions of Father and Son in the King James Bible. Are you kidding? That's the equation that Jesus Christ spoke. Jesus didn't speak very many mathematical equations. 
So it's not like we're just cherry picking and say, hey, look at all these math equations that Jesus spoke and he, look, this one matches. No, I don't know of any other equation that he spoke at all, at least when, you, when it comes to multiplication. Maybe he said seven, yeah, seven times, but nothing where he's putting two numbers together, multiplying two numbers together. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. This is talking to Peter. Peter was asking, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Peter says, no, not seven. Jesus says, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. And he doesn't even say 70 times 7 times. He just says until 70 times 7. Now, I've done I've shown these patterns before to people and one of the reactions was really interesting to this. They got they got very upset at all of this, saying it was demonic numerology and they said that's way out of context. Jesus didn't mean that. He was talking about uh, something else in the context. He's talking about forgiving your brothers. He's talking about basically this is complete forgiveness. This is the number of completion of forgiveness. How do you think father and son being mentioned 70 times 7 times is not the is not equivalent is not a pattern after the completion of forgiveness. Do you think God the Father and God the Son have not completed forgiveness for your sins? I mean, it's common sense. It's, it's directly collect, connected to each other. So, how do I put this into words? How do you look at this and think this is all random? Pray to God and ask Him. But you see, the thing is, it doesn't stop here. For example, in the Gospels, with father and son, it overlaps with other mentions in the Gospels. For example, in the Gospels, if you look at all the mentions of son, it's 164 mentions. That is how many times the word salvation shows up in the King James Bible. That is the only word in the King James Bible that shows up 164 times. There are no other words in the Bible that is mentioned 164 times besides salvation. And are you serious? That's how many times son shows up in the Gospels. For example... This one might go a little bit past your head. I don't really want to take the time to explain it right now, but if you're familiar with Hebrew numerics, Jehovah, the name of the Lord, has a, numer a Hebrew numeric value of 26. Father plus all uppercase Lord in the King James Bible. So in the New Testament, in the Gospels, I should say, sorry, in the Gospels, seven times 26 mentions. And obviously, if you look at, for example, Matthew 22, 44, where it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, The Lord said unto my Lord, This is God the Father, this is God the Son, this is Jesus Christ. So this is the Lord, Jehovah, that's referring to the Father. And by the way, it shouldn't even be there in the because it's not in the Greek. They're translating from Greek, but there is no Greek word here. In the Greek text for Jehovah, it's literally the same one as, as Kyrios. Both of these are Kyrios. But for whatever reason, in 1629, the editors of the King James Bible flipped this to, to all uppercase Lord. All uppercase means it's Jehovah, the name of God. So Mark 12, 36, and then also in Luke 20, 42, it also is the same way. Anyways, now these are, are running parallel, overlapping each other in the Gospels. Because father is producing this pattern, and son is producing that pattern, and they're also together, mentioned seven times, seven times, seven times. 
But those are just the light examples. The more extreme examples are the fact that Jesus says, my father, 49 times in the Gospels. So seven times, seven times. So you see how that overlaps as well. So here, whenever he says, my father, that's another mention of father in this pattern. So these are connected to each other. So seven times, seven times, God, Jesus says, my father. But look at this. In the Gospels, father, again, plus God. <laughs> that's, who God is. that's who the father is, God, God the father. And again, these are only talking about God the father. It's, and that's it. It's not looking at the anti-mentions. Now, 70 times 7 mentions in the Gospels of God plus Father, and 7 times 7 times 7 mentions of Father plus Son. And meanwhile, there are part of all these other patterns, including producing 70 times 7 mentions of Father plus Son in the whole Bible. No. There's absolutely no way. There is just zero possible way that that, overlapping with this, and that, and that, and this is overlapping here. And I didn't even add other ones that I could have added here. For example, when you look at Jesus case sensitive, when you're looking at the capitalized J, and you're not looking at all the uppercase mentions, but just capitalized Jesus plus Son plus Messiah in the Gospels, it's 777 mentions. I didn't even add that one on here. And there's other ones, I'm sure there's probably a ton of them that I haven't found. Um, how? That's, that's, again, Matthew 18, 22. In the Gospels, in a pattern with the same... I can't even wrap my head around it. I can't even explain it properly because it's just so mind-blowing. And if you just can't see that as being utterly impossible now let me just explain this real quick as well because this is something called a conjoined mention so in john six twenty seven says which the son of man shall give unto you for him hath god the father sealed this is the only this is the only let me circle that better this is the only time in the gospels where you see the conjoined mention of god the father God the Father, all is one. So we include that because it's all uh, together. We include that as one mention instead of two. So when you do that, you get the total count of 70 times 7. There's just no way. There's just no way that's all happening with all the overlap, all the intersection of those one, two, three, four, five, and ultimately six, seven different patterns in the midst of all this happening as well. So, once again, I will read it again because it's worthy to be read again. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Do you know who's testifying here? I would say it's the Holy Ghost, and it's the Father and the Son. Working a miracle. This is happening. This exists. It's almost like when God says, I am that I am. This exists. You go buy a, a King James Bible from Walmart or from Amazon or from local church Bible publishers, you will have this in your hands. This, all these patterns. Now, it didn't, it, let me just emphasize one other thing. This didn't ha exist in 1611. This, just to get your, your juices going. This didn't always exist in the King James Bible. It literally fell into place over time through standardization of language. 
we're dealing with omnipotence here. We're dealing with God knowing, not just omnipotence, omniscience. We're dealing with God knowing the end from the beginning. Knowing exactly where every single capitalized mention would end up in his Bible. Knowing in 1611 what it had to be in order to get to this. Knowing that over time this is going to be updated. But now it's at the point, and this was a good, this was a good, this is good to think about because People have questioned and commented about this in the past. Why, why, not, why isn't it the same in 1611? Well, think about it like this. English wasn't fully complete in 1611. English was still evolving at that point. If it was like that in 1611, these, this pattern would have been gone. If this pattern existed, all these patterns, I should say, all these anomalies existed in 1611, they would have all disappeared because English language wasn't yet ready. And over time, as the English language evolved, all these things just fell into place. And now, now, we all have Bibles, and it's pretty much locked into place at this point. Who's going to go and change the King James Bible when we have it in digital? We have every single word in a database. We know all these different patterns exist now. If you go back and start tampering with the King James Bible now, now that it's in its final and settled form, what what for what reason or intention do you have to tamper with it? You don't have any. And you would you would frankly, without without King James Bible believers knowing of any of this, they would make a pretty big fuss if they heard their Bible has been messed with. And it wouldn't go well with the printers. The King James Bible that we have today is settled literally forever because of digital. Because we have all of this in and, and we have printers in, ma in all around the world printing witness after witness after witness after witness the King James Bible in its final form. So yes, there was a period of of standardization of a liquid word of God, if you will, where just like with, with silver, if you want to get pure silver, you need to liquefy it first, obviously, to get the impurities out. So there was a liquid form of the King James Bible, but now it is being handed to you as a pure piece of silver that's never going to change, and this is what it looks like. And this is just episode number one. So I hope this was a blessing to you. And if you have Jewish or Islam Muslim friends, what do they have in response to this happening in the most printed Bible in history? Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next episode. And may the Lord Jesus Christ receive all the glory. This is his book. I, I need no glory. I don't need any praise. Everything, all glory to the Lord. Thank you, God, for giving us a perfect Bible. See you in the next episode. God bless. So something that we didn't include in this chart because we didn't know about it back when this chart was made was that Father plus Son plus Jesus, when you include all the possessive mentions, gives you a total of 70 times 7 plus 70 times 7 mentions in the Gospels. And in addition to the 70 times 7 mentions of Father and Son singular in the entire Bible, we've also discovered that if you look at the possessive mentions as well, so Father or Fathers plus Son or Sons, but there are no mentions of Sons with the apostrophe. So all the possible mentions of Father or Son capitalized in the King James Bible referring to God the Father or Jesus Christ are mentioned 70 times 7 times in the New Testament before the book of Revelation. So all the Gospels, all the historical books, the Gospels, the Acts, and all the Epistles, Father and Son show up 70 times 7 times when you're looking at either singular or possessive. Now Revelation is a very different book than the rest of the New Testament. And keep in mind when we think of the Father and Son, they're sitting together on the mercy seat in heaven, right? But in Revelation, 
Jesus is no longer sitting on that mercy seat. He is standing up. We see Jesus Christ and we see the wrath of the Lamb as he returns to this earth to become king of the earth. So it's interesting that we have both this father and son showing up 70 times, 7 times in the entire Bible. But we have this double witness in that all mentions of father and son show up 70 times, 7 times in the New Testament before the wrath of God is revealed on earth in the book of Revelation. And the only other major pattern I would say that we didn't include was that if you look at every 77th book of the Bible, so starting with Judges and then 2 Chronicles, Ecclesiastes, Hosea, Habakkuk, Luke, Ephesians, Titus, 2 John, all of those books combined produce 77 mentions of father or son with or without possessive mentions. So there are patterns with possessive mentions as well. I just wanted to throw those in there. We didn't actually know about them at the time that I recorded this video, but now we do. And all glory to the Lord Jesus Christ for revealing all this. Thanks. We'll see you in the next episode.